In our last episode, we worked our way through Tier 7 of the complete video game console Iceberg. It's starting to get insanely difficult to find old commercials and print media, and sometimes even pictures, but I'm determined to bring you at least a brief history of every single video game console ever made. So let's drop down to Tier 8, where we'll start getting into some very old and very rare and obscure consoles. I can almost guarantee you there's at least one or two systems on this tier that you've never even heard of, and I hope you'll learn a little something from the video. So let's just get right into it and take a deep dive into Tier 8, starting with one of the very first home video game consoles ever made, the Bally Astrocade. The Bally Astrocade, also known as the Bally Arcade, is a second generation video game console and simple computer system designed by the popular arcade game publisher Midway. It was originally marketed by Mail Order Catalog for release in 1977, but due to production delays it was released the following year. The original cost was $299, which is well over $1300 today adjusted for inflation. The machine was renamed the Bally Professional Arcade by the time it shipped, but it had little retail exposure outside of computer stores. That year, Bally decided to leave the market, and a corporate buyer from Montgomery Ward stepped in and bought the rights to the console and sold it as the Bally Computer System before finally changing its name to the Astrocade in 1982. The Astrocade is mostly known for its very powerful graphics for the time. It had a 1.7 MHz CPU, up to 64 kilobytes of RAM with upgradable modules, 8 kilobytes of ROM, and up to a 320 by 204 screen resolution in 8 colors with the installed RAM add-ons. The Astrocade was one of the first cartridge-based consoles, and its games were known as Videocades. The system also included two games built into the console itself, Gunfight and Checkmate, along with a calculator and a doodle program called Scribbling. Most cartridges included two games, and when they were inserted into the machine, it would boot to a menu listing the programs on the cartridge first, and then the four built-in programs. On the front of the unit was a 24-key hex pad keyboard used for selecting games and options, as well as operating the calculator. On the back were a number of ports, including connectors for power, controller ports supporting up to four controllers, and an expansion port. On the top rear of the unit was an empty space that could be opened to store up to 15 game cartridges. There were a total of 28 games released for the Astrocade, including many popular arcade classics like Space Invaders, Galaxia, Sea Wolf, and Grand Prix Demolition Derby. When purchased in 1981, the Astrocade also included a basic programming language cartridge so that the user could use a simple line editor to program in the basic language. Programs were entered via the calculator keypad with a plastic overlay displaying letters, symbols, and basic keywords. These were selected through a set of four colored shift keys on the keyboard. One available peripheral was the Zgrass unit that sat under the Astrocade and turned it into a real computer, including a full keyboard, a math coprocessor, 32 kilobytes of RAM, and a new 32 kilobyte ROM containing the Grass programming language. The unit also added I.O. ports for a cassette and floppy disk, allowing it to be used with CPM, which is a DOS-style operating system at the time. The Astrocade was a pretty successful system, but the video game crash of 1983 brought an end to this area of video game consoles, and the company discontinued production later that year. While the Astrocade was being produced in the U.S. in 1977, a new company from Japan was getting into the home video game market, and their name is Nintendo. The Color TV game is the first video game console ever made by Nintendo. The system was released as a series of five dedicated game consoles between 1977 and 1980 and available only in Japan. By the late 1970s, Nintendo began moving away from toys and playing cards and into the rapidly growing video game market. This decision was based on the smash success of the arcade game Space Invaders in 1978. Nintendo had no prior experience in manufacturing electronics and had previously contracted Mitsubishi for production of EVR Race, which was a very large arcade machine, so they decided to work with them again for the Color TV game. For the first two consoles, Color TV Game 6 and Color TV Game 15, Nintendo acquired a license from Magnavox to produce its own Pong clone game consoles. The Color TV Game 6 was launched on June 1, 1977. It retailed at a price of 9,800 yen, or about 360 US dollars today, which was much lower than competing systems, and Nintendo used this as their marketing tool. It contained six variations of Pong, such as adding additional paddles, decreasing the size of the paddles, and adding deflecting shields in the center of the screen. It can be powered by batteries or by a power adapter sold separately. Two weeks later, Nintendo released an improved version of the TV Game 6 featuring a cream white outer casing and removed the power adapter. A second variation was produced as part of a promotion with company House Foods to promote its House Shanman Instant Noodles. It's identical to the original TV Game 6, but has the House Shanman logo on the casing. This version was produced in limited quantities, making it incredibly rare today. 
Sharp Electronics also produced a dark orange colored version of the TV Game 6 to bundle with its television sets. One week after the release of the TV Game 6, on June 8th, Nintendo released the Color TV Game 15. It retailed for 15,000 yen or about 540 US dollars. In reality, the TV Game 15 is a re-release of the TV Game 6, only it has 15 games. The TV Game 15 has detachable controllers which are stored in a small compartment on the system. Nintendo produced a second model of the TV Game 15 with a reddish orange casing which had a longer production run and are more common today. Sharp also made a white colored version that was renamed Color TV Game XG115 and is quite rare. The third version, the Color TV Game Racing 112, was released a year later in June of 1978 and is significantly larger than the previous two consoles. The built-in game is a top-down racer similar to Speed Race, which was an arcade game of the era. The console comes with two paddle controllers for multiplayer support and the name came from the 112 possible game combinations. Color TV Game Block Kazushi was released the next year in April of 1979 at 13,500 yen. This version of the system was produced by Nintendo themselves, allowing its name to be displayed directly on the console. Block Kazushi includes six cloned variations of Breakout, which was an arcade game released in America by Atari. The system's casing was designed by Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto and was one of his very first designs with the company. The final console, the Computer TV Game, was released in 1980. Because dedicated game consoles were decreasing in popularity, the computer TV game was only produced in limited quantities, making it incredibly rare today. Miyamoto again designed the system's white colored casing and the packaging. The color TV game series was very successful for Nintendo and it was a commercial hit. In 1983, they stopped production of the color TV game, having sold well over 30 million units in total. This allowed them to concentrate on the next generation of video game consoles, the family computer, which became the Nintendo Entertainment System in the US. Widely considered one of the greatest video game systems of all time, the NES would not exist today had it not been for the success of the Color TV game. Another Japanese company seeking to compete with Nintendo in 1977 was Takatoku, designing Japan's first ever cartridge-based console, the Video Cassette Rock. In 1977, the video game industry in Japan was not very developed. A few Pong-type consoles existed, but none of the more modern cartridge-based consoles such as the Fairchild Channel F and the RCA Studio 2 had made it to Japan yet. Takatoku, a toy maker in Japan, wanted to release a system to compete with Nintendo and Bandai. At the time, General Instruments had just released the Gemini 8600 concept, which allowed companies to release a cheap, cartridge-based video game console using parts provided by General Instruments themselves. Takatoku saw an opportunity to be the first to market a system based on this technology in Japan. Released in October of 1977 as the Takatoku Video Cassette Rock Service Set, it became the first cartridge based video game console ever made in Japan. The service set has paddles and came with six ball game cartridges and was sold for 13,800 yen, which is about $500 today converted and adjusted for inflation. Two months later in December, Takatoku released the basic set, which switched the paddles for joysticks and came with the eight ball game cartridge. The basic set was the most expensive version selling for 17,500 yen or about $650 today and it was also possible to purchase the console itself with no game cartridges for 9,800 yen or about $375 today. There were 7 games in total made for the system including a tank game, car race, stunt rider, and two audio synthesizer cartridges. The video cassette rock never really caught on due to the competition of the Nintendo Color TV games and the Bandai TV Jack consoles, making it very rare and sought after by collectors today. Heading back to the US to one of the very first American made cartridge based home video game consoles, it's the APF MP1000. The APF microcomputer system is a second generation 8 bit cartridge based video game console released in October of 1987 by APF Electronics. The console is often referred to as the M1000 or the MP1000, which are the two model numbers of the console. It sold for $129, which is a little over $550 today adjusted for inflation. The MP1000 is a successor to the APF TV Fun line of first generation consoles, which were Pong style game systems very similar to the Coleco Telstar, having four simple games built into the unit. It was an 8-bit system and the only second generation console to use the Motorola 68000 CPU running at 0.895 MHz with 1 KB of RAM and up to a 256 by 192 screen resolution in 4 colors or 128 by 192 in 8 colors. The APF MP1000 comes built in with the game Rocket Patrol and there are a total of 13 games produced for the system. 
Some of these titles include Baseball, Blackjack, and Space Destroyers. Hearing that Atari was developing a computer add-on for the 2600, ABF designed a peripheral called the Imagination Machine, which was a docking station allowing the user to attach the game console to, turning it into a full-fledged home computer. It had a built-in keyboard and cassette player, and could attach to a floppy disk drive and a modem. The Imagination Machine alone sold for $599 in 1979, which is well over $2,500 today adjusted for inflation. But unfortunately, the Imagination Machine couldn't save the company. APF had spent a lot of money in developing the MP1000 and the Imagination Machine, and by 1981 had more than $7 million in debt. The video game industry was failing, and the bank asked APF to concentrate on their line of calculators, which was still successful, in order to pay back their loans. The APF management refused to change their business strategy and gave the company to the bank under foreclosure, having sold just over 50,000 units of the system before being discontinued completely after only four years of production. As APF Electronics was leaving the game console market in the early 1980s, Electronics giant Casio was entering it with their first console ever, the PV-1000. The PV-1000 is a third generation home video game console manufactured by Casio and released in Japan in 1983. In the early 1980s, Casio was one of the most respected brands in electronics, and based on their success, they decided to extend their reach and release two other devices to appeal to gamers. The PV-1000, a dedicated video game system, and the PV-2000, a computer loosely based on the MSX system. The PV-1000 was released in October of 1983, priced at 14,800 yen, which is about $325 today converted into Justin for inflation. The Nintendo Famicom was very popular at the time and was out of stock in many stores. Casio hoped to capitalize on that and offer an alternative game console. The PV-1000 is powered by a Zlong Z80 CPU and had 2 kilobytes of RAM with 1 kilobyte allocated as VRAM. It had a 256 by 192 screen resolution with 8 colors. There were only 13 games developed for the system, some of which include Dig Dug, Turpin, Super Cobra, and Space Panic. It had a joystick style controller with a start, select, and trigger button. Casio failed to achieve significant sales numbers. The exact reason for the failure of the console is unknown, but many factors may have played a role in its demise, including poor marketing and the confusion created by the PV-2000 computer that also uses cartridges but that were incompatible with the PV-1000s. Nevertheless, after a few weeks on store shelves, the PV-1000 was discontinued, making this console extremely rare today. Now let's move forward a few years to the mid 1980s to Worlds of Wonders shooting based video game system, the Action Max. The Action Max is a home video game console using VHS tapes for games. It was manufactured in 1987 by Worlds of Wonder and initially sold for $99, which is about $250 today adjusted for inflation. It was released mostly in North America with a few consoles having been shipped to Europe. The Action Max required the player to have a VCR to be able to play its games. VHS tapes are used to play a short movie. Whenever something targetable would come up on the screen, players shoot at the television and a sensor would pick up the signal from the light gun. The gaming is strictly point-based and not dependent on shot accuracy, and as a result, players can't really win or lose the game. The system's appeal was limited by this and the fact that the only real genre of games for the system were light gun games. And the games played out the exact same way every time you played, leading to its quick market decline with only 5 games being produced for the system. By September of 1987, the company was in deep financial trouble with nearly $240 million in debt, and by December of that year they fired nearly half of their employees. By 1988, the company filed for bankruptcy and was liquidated later that year. The creditors continued to operate the company to recoup their losses until finally closing its doors in late 1990. The Action Max was seen as a commercial failure and it's pretty rare to find today, although not really desired by collectors. As the Action Max was leaving the market, the VTEC company was just entering it with their educational game console, the Socrates. The VTech Socrates is an 8-bit educational video game console released in 1988 at a cost of $130, which is about $325 today adjusted for inflation. The console features a robot character called Socrates, named after the philosopher, that's very similar to the Johnny Five robot from the Short Circuit movies. The system was pretty expensive when it was released, and the cost put it at odds with other educational toys, and even VTech's own products like the WizKid systems. The Socrates was released just as the third generation of video game consoles like Sega Genesis and the NES were on the way out. The system includes a full keyboard which was wireless and two wired controllers, 
but consoles vary in their effectiveness in receiving the signals. Some can receive signals from up to 12 feet away, while others require the player to be almost directly in front of the receiver. The mouse and touchpad peripherals used for the CAD Professor and touchpad cartridges also use infrared signals, and similar issues caused many problems with them. The Socrates system is bundled with games in five categories, math problems, word problems, word games, music games, and Super Painter. Additional games for the system were packaged as cartridges which resemble 3.5 inch floppy disks and there were nine of these games in total. The Yeno company also distributed the game in Europe. In Germany, under the name Professor Weiss Als, which translates to Professor Knows Everything, and in France as the Professor Sci 2, Jeu Educaf Video, where Sci 2 comes from the French phrase meaning knows all. VTech also distributed the system in Canada, being sold as the Socrates Sci 2, Jeu Educaf Video. Because of the Socrates' high cost and limited game library, it quickly became obsolete among other educational consoles. The system itself was slow and made learning with the games uninteresting. After only a few years of production, it was discontinued in the early 1990s. While the Socrates turned out to be a failure, the next console on our list was far from it. Being a huge success in South Korea, it's the Daewoo Zemix. The Zemix is the first video game console made by Daewoo Electronics in Korea and was first released in 1985. The name Zemix means it's fun in Korean and the console was not sold outside of South Korea. It originally sold for $199 which is about $550 today adjusted for inflation. The Zemix is essentially an MSX home computer refitted into a home console like Shell and because of that many of the games released for it are also compatible with the MSX computer. There are at least 30 known games for the Zemix, which are mostly MSX titles released in cartridge format for the console, although some of the consoles used a CD-ROM format to play MSX games directly. The Zemix was manufactured and sold in a wide variety of designs other than the standard model. Some of these include the Zemix 50 series that came in pink and white, pink and blue, and yellow and blue, the Zemix Victory, which came in a variety of colorways including black and red, white and gray, and black with yellow and blue. The Zemix Super Victory, which was a simpler design with just a cartridge slot and a power button available in black and red, and pink and white. And the Zemix Turbo, which had a robotic spaceship design and is incredibly rare and hard to find today. There were a number of peripherals made by both Daewoo and Zemina for the Zemix, including joysticks, keyboards, RAM expansion cards, a music box, and a family card that allowed you to play Nintendo Famicom games on the Zemix console due to the fact that there were no copyright laws in Korea at the time. Then there was this, the Zemix Kobo, that included a monitor, a storage tray for games, and this very strange console layout with built-in keyboards and symmetrical buttons for two players. Incredibly, the Zemix was produced for over 10 years until it was finally discontinued in 1995. Moving on from the success of the Zemix to another failure of a game console, we head back to the US for a look at the Hyperscan. The Hyperscan is a home video game console from the toy company Mattel, first released in October of 2006 at a price of $69.99, which is just over $100 today adjusted for inflation. The Hyperscan was Mattel's second video game console after the Intellivision released way back in 1979. Released a few weeks before the Sony PlayStation 3 and during the domination of the Nintendo Wii, Mattel tried to ride the wave of the collectible trading card industry. With the success of the Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon trading card games, Mattel wanted to appeal to this generation and had the licenses to do so. Mattel had the ability to make an affordable system that would bridge video games and card collecting. The idea was simple, to use RFID technology embedded in each trading card to affect the games. The console came with the X-Men fighting game on a CD and one controller. Two other games were also available at launch, Ben 10 and Interstellar Wrestling League, both priced at $20. Additional cards for each game were available in a booster pack of 6 cards each for $10. Marvel Heroes, the fourth game of the console, was released in November of 2006, followed by Spider-Man, which was exclusively released at Toys R Us, and those were the only five games made for the system. The console was universally criticized for its clunky design, broken controls, poor game library, long loading screen, and the unnecessary need for playing cards to select characters, forcing kids to buy booster packs in hope of finding characters to play in the game. The games felt rushed and had problems varying from having major slowdowns to being literally unplayable. The graphics were very outdated by the time it was released, but players might have been able to overlook this if the gameplay was good, which it wasn't. 
It wasn't long before the consoles were sold at a clearance price of only $9.99, while the games were sold for $1.99 and booster packs for $0.99. Cents. PC World Magazine named the Hyperscan one of the top 10 worst video game systems of all time. It was finally discontinued in 2007, less than a year after its release, selling fewer than 10,000 consoles in total. And that's it for tier 8 of the complete video game console iceberg. If you made it this far, I really do appreciate it, and if you took a second to click the like button, that would be amazing. Let me know in the comments if you had any of these game consoles, or if you had an opportunity to play any of them. We're starting to get into some incredibly rare and obscure consoles now, and there will be plenty more in the next episode. I have lots in store for the channel, and I upload new videos every single week, so be sure to subscribe if you want to get notified of new iceberg videos. I also have a poll on my channel in the community tab, so you can help me choose the iceberg series I do next. So be sure to check that out and vote which iceberg topic you want to see in the next series after I'm finished with this one. I'll do that with each iceberg video series I make, so you the viewer will determine what videos get made next. You can follow me on all social media platforms at Iceberg Docs if you want to stay updated and connect with me, and if you want to help support the channel you can do that too by becoming a Patreon, where you'll get early access to all my documentaries before they get to YouTube. Links are in the description. Again I thank each and every one of you for your support and for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.